Thank you very much for joining us today. It's so nice to see all of you. We appreciate you taking time out of your busy day to be here. Before we introduce this esteemed panel that is going to be discussing women, democracy, and technology, I would like to introduce our moderator for the day, Ms. Tina Brown. Tina is the founder and editor-in-chief of the Newsweek Daily Beast, which I know many of you read every day, um, as I do. She is a frequent guest on uh, talk shows and news shows. I often see her on the Morning Joe show, which I enjoy every morning. She is really one of the most influential, high-profile, talked-about editors in the world, and she is a woman. She's also been the editor-in-chief of some other important magazines, Vanity Fair and The New Yorker. In addition to her day job, she also has a great interest in women and women's empowerment, and she helps run a remarkable organization called Women in the World Summit, which meets every year in New York, and I believe they just had their uh, 2013 meeting in April. And it brings together women from across the world to come together and tell stories about their daily lives and their professional lives. And they re reach a remarkable group of over 4 million, 41 million people via Twitter and 400 million Twitter impressions. So I think that's a great way to launch this discussion on technology. We encourage you to Facebook and tweet about this discussion, you can tweet at NDI, hashtag NDI MKA. And I will not stand in the way for a wonderful discussion. Thank you, Tina, for joining us and for all of you ladies for being here today. Thank you. Shari, for that great introduction. And uh, it's wonderful to be here with all of you. And of course, with my dear friend, uh, Secretary Albright. I've checked out her pin this morning and I'm glad to see it's nothing malevolent, no serpents like she used. It's actually a very smiling Lady Liberty because as she said, she's the greatest gal of all. So that's great to see that. Um, well, of course, um, we all know the great work that NDI has done to increase the number of women civic leaders, voters, candidates, and political party representatives and elected leaders. And um, so this is a great time, I think, to now look at what a, a women, uh, how women can benefit from all the expanding uh, new kinds of technology and communication. Uh, I did see the awesome power of that technology, as Sherry mentioned, at our recent Women in the, uh, 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 women in the World Summit, when we reached 41 million people through Twitter. But of course, um, uh, the dilemma for, for governing now is, in this exploding tech-driven world, is that people expect a lot, now that they have social media, to push these issues up. But government institutions are often responding using 19th century technology. Uh, even at our own summit, I was thinking, you know, we've reached all these people through Twitter, but how does one corral their response back? How does one engage back so that this is an ongoing, sustainable conversation uh, as opposed to a kind of a top-down dissemination of information? And frustrated demand from the bottom-up is sometimes coupled with a sense of disenfranchisement in the system and a belief that partisan institutions no longer matter. So I think one of the great questions uh, that, you know, for NDI to ponder and for us all here to ponder is, how does government come back with a responsive effort? And how do you get, as Madeline has said, from Tahrir Square to governance? Ideas are released into the ether, but then people at the grass le level are frustrated because they don't seem to be getting any feedback. And how do we change that? Unfortunately, women uh, still lag behind men in access to the technologies that can be transformative and their ability to participate politically and socially. So given the pressing need to include more women in the political process, we're now going to discuss really how technology can expand that participation and integrate their voices and, uh, and, and think about how does technology help to get more women into the process. So this morning our panel uh, is a, a terrific group of people who can all speak very interestingly to that. With us uh, to my left, of course, is, is the Honorable Madeleine uh, K. Albright. She was, as we all know, the first female Secretary of State in America, a position that's been held by two women since, so maybe it's only fair to let a guy have a turn just for this one <laughs> next four years. When it comes to geopolitics, of course, uh, Secretary Albright is, is really as old school as they come, but she's also a very innovative mind, and she's seen with her own eyes 
the power of new school technology to reshape the world. We're going, and we're going to hear from her uh, today some of the very vivid examples she has of what she's seen in all of her travels and, and consultations. Uh, she's been a long-time advocate for women's participation in government and politics. And prior to becoming Secretary of State, she was the US permanent representative to the United Nations. And she led that United Nations delegation to the famous Fourth World Conference on Women in Beijing with Hillary Clinton, which proved to be such a seminal moment in um, uh, the global women's movement. Also joining us is Stephanie Cutter, a formidable political strategist who might be best described well, I hope you don't mind me saying this, as uh, James Carville on estrogen. <laughs> 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 Having a little doubt about that now, I've just said it, but anyway. She is a partner at Precision Strategies and the founder of the Cutter Media Group. She served as deputy campaign manager for President Obama's two, uh, 2012 re-election campaign, and she oversaw media, communications, policy, and research. She was chairman of the board for the 2013 Presidential Inaugural Committee, deputy senior advisor to President Obama, overseeing his message strategy. And she devised the confirmation strategy for the Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor and helped create the first Ladies Let's Move campaign. In other words, she's somebody you really want on your side. Um, and our third panelist uh, is, um, uh, where are you? Yes, just sitting two doors down here is Shelley Eskew, Vice President at Intel Corporation, Global Director of the company's Corporate Affairs Group and President of the Intel Foundation. She oversees professionals in over 35 countries to enhance Intel's reputation as the world's leading tech brand and corporate citizen. Uh, she drove the creation of the Corporate Affairs Group. And just recently, she's been a, a, a pioneer sponsor, really, of this new brilliant movie, uh, Girl Rising, that Intel has, has, has uh, funded, a documentary that promotes girls' education around the globe. And if you haven't seen it, I do recommend it. It's, it's gripping and very moving indeed. Uh, another pioneering woman is Ping Fu of 3D System. Uh, Ping is an innovator and scientist herself. She's created groundbreaking technologies. She was honored in 2005 by Inc. Magazine as the Int Entrepreneur of the Year. She co-founded Geomagic, a 3D imaging software company in 1997 and previously was involved in the NSCA Mosaic software that led to internet browsers as we know them today. And she serves on the White House's National Advisory Council on Innovation and Entrepreneurship. If you haven't read her gripping memoir, Bend Not Break, I recommend it thoroughly because it's an astonishing insight, both into the harsh reality of growing up in the Cultural Revolution in China, as she did, and shows how her tenacity and her brilliance uh, made her a pioneer uh, when she came to the United States. And finally, uh, Dr. Laura Inez L Lopez Padilla, president of the board of REAM. She worked for 10 years at the United Nations Development Program on issues including gender, social issues, and governance and she was a member of the Advisory Council on the Mexican and National Women's Institute from 2006 to 2012, and has served as coordinator of a large number of projects on gender and the political participation of women. She works with political parties and government institutes across Mexico to support women's leadership at the local level. Uh, before we start our conversation, let me take this opportunity to remind you that this would be an excellent time to turn off the ringers on your personal empowerment devices. <laughs> so, <laughs> Madeline, let's start with you. Um, you know a lot about uh, the role of information in change, and uh, as you said to me on the phone, your dissertation was on the role of the press in the Prague Spring in 1968, and later on the Solidarity Movement and cassette tapes. So, once upon a time, all of that was the new technology, and of course, that now sounds very old school. So. Tell me now how you feel this current moment is changing democratic movements around the world. Well, Tina, let me also thank you so much for coming to uh, okay. moderate us and to be here because you have been such a leader in your field you. and have managed to reinvent yourself many times and I'm full of admiration for you and delighted to, to be here with you. Um, I think that what we're looking at are kind of several um, elements at the same time. One is how to get women involved in politics internationally everywhere um, in terms of making sure that women are empowered because we feel that societies are better off when women are politically and economically empowered. And also, women are pretty good at uh, generally communicating with each other. I have to say, I, I look out here, I see my good friend, Ambassador Claudia Fritchie. She was part of my initial group at the UN where uh, six, seven of us, the G7 as we called ourselves, 
uh, had decided to create a support group, and we used the telephone uh, <laughs> because we said we would always answer each other's phone calls. Um, so we are very good at information. I think that what we are seeing now is the possibility of technology empowering women to be able to communicate with each other in local groups as well as trying to figure out how to get their message uh, to the higher levels of government. The question always is, is how the technology, whether it is being used in a way to really create political power. And therefore, one of the things that NDI looks at is how to use technology in a way that allows the women not only to communicate with each other, um, but to also empower a variety of groups that can work with each other, and then also trying to figure out how to get the message to the government. Um, whether we happen to believe that political parties are the best way to collect information. And so then trying to get women elected into office so that they then can use this communication in a way that uh, promotes the principles that we believe in. So it's this combination of, first of all, how to get women into politics, and then the example of how technology move the process forward. Uh, given how uh, very a lot of women don't have any access to technology, um, is there a danger that there's going to be a kind of economic gap, in a sense, between those who have technology and can use it and speak up and those who don't? That is the concern. Yeah. And, but I think that it's uh, different in different places. So for instance, a lot of women have access to technology in India. Um, and an awful lot of business is done over mobile phones and have the capability. In other places, uh, there are issues like that. And so the question is trying to figure out how to disperse the technology and then how to make the technology um, helpful rather than harmful. I think mm -hmm. one of the issues that we've talked about mm -hmm. is kind of the double-edged sword of, of technology. So it's a new instrument. Uh, the way it is now, not in terms of the way that information has always had some kind of a role, but trying to figure out the positive aspects of it and how to get it <laughs> distributed in a way that doesn't perpetuate divisions, but tries to uh, mitigate them. Thank you, Ping. Um, for those who aren't familiar with your story, uh, tell us here how technology changed your own life. Yeah. Um, well, technology really gave me a platform that transformed my life personally, socially, and then even politically. I came from China. I grew up in Cultural Revolution. I studied Chinese literature. And when I came to the United States, um, the only thing I could study was computer science, which is a man-made language. So that's how I uh, got into technology. Uh, got into supercomputing, started Mosaic. Um, internet browser, which is the first multimedia browser. From there, I found technology to be a great platform for me to be able to scale. You know, it, if it, we all have, we always have tools. We have pencils and paper, nails and hammers, but you can't scale. Technology is what allow you to create this, the kind of impact to society, to humanity that was never possible before. So I was always looking at how can we use technology to transcend humanity. Tell us about what you created with 3D, with your geomagic. Yeah, so this is interesting. When I, when I grew up, I worked in factories. Um, I used machineries. And so when I started a business, I decided to get into 3D printing. That was 15 years ago when nobody ever heard about 3D printing. So I was really trying to get into this technology where the machine, instead of printing paper, it actually printing product. And why is that important? It's important because it brings back the handcraftsmanship, the, the local manufacturing, and, and allow you to pr produce products start with you, the person, um, not design ones and build millions. So some of the technology that we have created that you may have heard of like Invisalign, that correcting teeth without line, uh, wire and brackets. Today, Invisalign builds 64,000 individualized aligner every day on the assembly line, you know, compared to things you ship to Asia to build your shoes. An Invisalign assembly line come down with individualized product. It's three times more productive than the shoe being made in Taiwan and it's made here. Well, um, Shelley, um, you at Intel 
uh, recently published a very uh, influential report uh, called Women in the Web. And uh, it's full of very interesting findings and, and nuggets. And um, what was the most remarkable fact that you drew from that uh, regarding women and access to technology? Thanks, Tina. I think the most remarkable fact was that there's this absolute lack of information about women's access to the internet. So as we all know, the internet has tremendous power for communication, for education, for growth, empowerment, and development, but there was no information about the gap for women in the developing world and the use of the internet. So with UN Women, um, the State Department's Office of Women, and World Pulse, we commissioned this study to look at how large that gap was and to really try to quantify it. And I think we're pretty horrified by the findings, which confirm what a lot of people who work in this area believe there's a tremendous gap. So we believe there's about 1.2 billion people who are accessing the internet today, which obviously is a small portion of the world. But yet women lag at least 23% behind in the developing world. And in some regions, it's even more tremendous. So in sub-Saharan Africa, for example, 45% fewer women than men access the internet. And that's already of the very small percent that are having access at all. So it just leaves women further behind and denies them this voice that the internet can give, this community that you can create, the opportunity for economic empowerment and political empowerment. Um, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Padilla, um, Mexico has made so much progress in the last decade and uh, the connectivity rate is much higher. How has your group, uh, Rayan, uh, been using technology? Well, we use the, the technology to communicate with the women leadership in the states, all the country. They, we use it very much, but we find that in the indigenous communities, for example, they have no, sometimes, even electricity and no uh, computer, and not a, a web, uh, the access to internet, and they have not um, a mobile phone, and then it's very complicated sometimes. We have different, uh, uh, we have uh, two zones very different. In the north, the, the access and the access of women is very, ex uh, ex we have, we have uh, iPads, we have uh, mobile phones, everything, but in the south, and in the communities, and uh, in indigenous communities, it's very <coughs> difficult. We have used the, all the, the technology that we have to communicate with those women, uh, mainly to the advisory uh, issues, and uh, invite to forums, to workshops, and to give them information about uh, political issues that they are uh, interested to know because sometimes all the information is in the in the capital in the in, in, in the, the Mexico City, and this information no uh, arrive to the the states or the rural communities that we work. Thank you, uh, uh, Stephanie. It's uh, you know we're hearing about sort of reaching women uh, voters kind of one by one. I mean, how did you do that in the Obama campaign because you were very successful using technology to uh, reach women voters and get them involved in this, sense, make them your own army. So how did you go about doing that? Well, um, when we were, um, you know, probably in the early stages of 2011 planning out our campaign, uh, we were living in the shadow of 2010 and Democrats for the first time in a long time lost the gender gap in 2010. Uh, many of the voters that had come out for Obama in, in 2008, many of the women voters weren't voting for Democrats, they were voting for Republicans. And that's a big challenge for Democrats because we can't, you can't win the presidential as a Democrat without a gender gap. Uh, so we initiated a series of women's programs, uh, Women for Obama, um, uh, Women Organizers for Obama, um, and made a big investment in pulling women back into the campaign. Um, women vote more often than men here. They made up 55% of the electorate in 2008, uh, and they get involved in elections more often than men uh, here in the United States. 
Um, so as we built this campaign, when we talk about technology, you know, that, that word gets thrown a lot, around a lot. Uh, obviously in 2008, the Obama campaign used uh, what, what we thought then was pathbreaking technology to reach voters and pull them back through, uh, through the internet, through social media. Uh, in 2012, we kind of blew that out of the water with the use of data uh, technology, uh, analytics. Uh, we never lost touch with our voters in 2008. Uh, we kept in touch with them through the course of uh, the four years, um, and we built on that. Um, we collected uh, data from the field. Uh, we used uh, data that we were able to acquire, uh, and we had these really smart guys in the back room who would run <laughs> analytics to, to help us model to figure out who our voters were and how we could best reach them, who they wanted to hear from, uh, whether it, if contacting them would make them less likely to vote for the president or more likely. We knew a lot about them. Uh, and that is what really the use of technology on the Obama campaign allowed us to do, to target that single voter, who were more often than not women. Um, and as we built this campaign uh, and, and built on our targeting techniques, we were able to build technologies for every single department on the campaign to make us do our jobs better. So in advertising, if we wanted to uh, reach a certain pocket of women in Des Moines, Iowa, uh, we could figure out what they were watching through uh, acquisition of public data from cable companies, overlay that with our own data, and figure out what they were watching and when, and ensure that our advertising was targeting them at the moment that they wanted to be receiving information. Uh, in uh, the communications press department, we were able to figure out what women were watching, what they were reading, who they were listening to, uh, what online sites, sites they were going to, and we targeted those. On the ground, uh, you know, this has been true for President Obama since he started running in 2007, but the majority of the volunteers are women, the majority of donors were women, more than 60% of our donors were women, compared to only 30% for Governor Romney. Um, our organizers, a majority of them were women. Uh, much of our senior staff, not just at headquarters, but across the country, were women. So it's, I think you could say that in many ways the campaign was fueled by women and we created through the use of technology ways so that we could target the individual woman on the ground, get her involved in the campaign, get her registered to vote, make sure that she was coming out to vote, hopefully get her to be a volunteer and have her go organize a series of other women um, and the concentric circles got bigger and bigger. But how did you make that, convert that one woman who was interested into being an organizer of other women? Well, um, it, it's a, a, a really just a personal conversation. It's not something that you can do through a, you know, a, a technology application, but um, that personal conversation, that personal touch um, is really d not just for women, but for uh, men as well, is how we created this volunteer base. We had 30,000 full-time national team leaders, which are uh, organizers, right. volunteer organizers who took over neighborhoods across the country. Again, a major majority of those were women. Um, it, you know, I guess one thing to keep in mind, technology is an, an enormous important tool in politics in reaching people, getting them involved, and getting them to vote. Um, but something has to be behind the technology uh, and something for people to believe in. And the, you know, the, the way the president communicated about the economy, which was very values-based, uh, appealed to women. Uh, his agenda on education and the way he talked about it appealed to women. The health care law, the Affordable Care Act, was a huge tool for us to reach women uh, because it allowed us to go in and make sure they understood how they could get contraception with no out-of-pocket costs, free preventive care, they didn't have to pay uh, copay for their mammograms anymore. Th that those, the ability to make it issue-based and values-based is really, you know, that's, that's the first step. Technology allows you to bring it over the finish line. Um, Madeline, let's talk a little bit about the Arab Spring and what that's shown us about uh, at least uh, how to use tech and what's happening there. Uh, I'm, uh, when, when our summit, Women of the World, last year, we had Dahlia Ziadi, who's a brilliant uh, Egyptian activist, and she used she was a blogger during the Tahrir Square. She used social media as a tremendous sort of get out the uh, enthusiasm tool, and then she ran for office. She lost, and now last time I saw her a few months ago, she was very discouraged, really, mm -hmm. about how she felt that women had been so much a part of that revolution. 
had been uh, enthused and encouraged and brought out very often by Facebook, by Twitter uh, initially, and had been part of it. And now they were being kind of kicked back, not back as if they really didn't have a role anymore. How do you see that panning out and what can, uh, what can uh, the tools of technology and indeed you know, the NDI <coughs> kind of initiatives, what can we do to, to change that? Well, I, I do think that the whole issues in the Arab awakening are, are very complicated. And um, I had, I've told this story, but I'll, I'll tell it again. As I was uh, last uh, two winters ago in a discussion with an Arab male, um, and I said, well, we can't call it the Arab Spring anymore because it's the winter, so let's call it the Arab awakening. And he got <coughs> furious at me, and he said, that's such an insult. The Arabs haven't been asleep all this time. And I said, so what would you call it? And he said, Arab troubles. And I said, what about Arab opportunities? So in those four <laughs> thoughts, Never try to have the last word with Nadine, know, by the how, way. <laughs> how complicated it is. Yeah. What I find interesting is a lot of what happened across North Africa, particularly, one could say had begun in many ways as a women's story, because the, the young man who immolated himself in Tunisia, what had happened was that his father had died and his mother could not inherit the mm. land because of the laws. Mm. So he didn't have money to go buy uh, his various vegetables. Now, that sounds like an interesting women's story, except what happened was that the low-level police official who disrespected him was a woman, which, may, which created a problem even greater for him than just uh, being disrespected, and he immolated himself. And so there were many, many immolations across North Africa. I don't think we heard about a lot of them. Some of them had to do <coughs> with lack of dignity or economic opportunity, some with wanting to make decisions about their own lives. <coughs> I do think that we have examples of women in a number of these places that were, in fact, all of a sudden liberated uh, because they did have access to technology to do something about it. The problem has been, and I think we have to look at this at a number of different levels. First of all, we have what has happened in the Arab world of, of setting loose an awful lot of ideas that have come as a result of them being suppressed for many years, and then also having the possibility of technology, period, men or women, all of a sudden being able to state their views, reconnecting or connecting with people that they might never have connected with before. So it in many ways was a blogger's revolution. Then there was the issue of how you do get from Tahrir Square to governance, and among those people were women who all of a sudden felt empowered in a number of different ways, but are now, in fact, again, um, part of a, of a social and economic and political situation which is not ready to deal with women. So one of the things that NDI is trying to do is connect the women generally in terms of support. Mm -hmm. One of the big technology advances that NDI has done, which we actually started long before this, is I Know Politics, which is a way of having a website where women can communicate with each other uh, across the board uh, in different countries in terms of sharing experiences and how to get trained to do political work and how to get ahead and how to create different groups. And I think that's one of our advances, but basically we still have to work an awful lot on just how women exist within systems that have not uh, actually seen women as political players. So there's that, and then as Stephanie said, part of it is technology, but part of it is a bunch of other things. And what I think we, it's interesting to listen to see what we can learn from you, which is there has to be a message. So part of what has to happen as we get more women into politics uh, in the world is to try to help them develop their message uh, and then get the training that they need to do. But so I think what NDI is trying to do is work on all those levels mm -hmm. of, you know, what is your message? How do you get involved? What is your support system? How do you connect with others? And how does technology help or hurt you? Um, Ping, uh, you know, thanks to your confinement uh, during the Cultural Revolution, you didn't receive any kind of formal education. It's all the more remarkable that you then became this tech entrepreneur when you came to America. Um, how do you think that women uh, can prepare themselves, you know, for this new era where these skills are so important? I mean, you know, you didn't have any of those skills and then you, you learned them but so many women in these uh, countries without any access to technology are just never gonna get these skills. How do they make that leap, do you think, between being people who just have no clue how to, how to use this and, and then actually get to the point where they can use it? It's such a huge education gap. Um, so 
when I came to the United States, I didn't, uh, my English was very poor, so I couldn't continue my field of study, which is Chinese literature. And I um, felt the door was closing <coughs> on me. And then somehow I suddenly saw that writing software and writing essays are the same. They're all writings. And it was to breaking down that mental barrier to allow me to see behind every closed door this, this new opportunity. So I got into the tech field. And, um, and then later I started a business in tech field. And very quickly I realized, oops, I'm in this field that there's very few women, um, and I'm short, and, and, and I'm twice as old as all the guys in there. So, so, so being short and woman and old isn't uh, very attractive <laughs> characters. So I thought, okay, how do I take, how do I take that situation and figure out uh, how could I take advantage of that? So I thought, hey, I'm a mother. I'm going to apply motherhood to the leadership. So much of I learned of how to run the company and how to lead the company was to apply the mother instincts um, to the company. And, and that turns out to be very successful. And I had no idea this is called servant leadership. And I have no idea that in the 21st century, that leadership is more like a woman's leadership. So, so, so that taught me that a lot of time, we do have capabilities. It's all in our mind. It's how we think about it. If we think that we can't do it, then we can't do it. And if we think that we are born to be able to do something, then we can do it because we all have equal skills. Actually, people's skill doesn't differ that much if you really look at it. Um, the very smart and very successful people to people who are normal are more or less the same. And what's different is how you think about it. And in terms of innovation, I think we all born with imaginations and sometimes school stamp that out of us. And what's innovation? <coughs> innovation is imagination applied. If you apply your imagination, you have innovation. So, so that's what my journey actually taught me about curiosity, about trust yourself, about being confident that you have the ability to push through. And another thing I like to tell women is that forget about this glass ceiling stuff. Forget about this corporate ladder and going up because going up is so hard, going forward. Okay, life is a mountain range. At every peak, the view is different. If you're going forward, the world is much bigger. So paying forward. Shelley, one of the things that jumped out of me in your study was that actually you're saying in, 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 in that, that study that, the, uh, that there's actually a widening to the gender divide. I mean, I thought I was going to read that it was closing. It was widening. Why is that? Well, there's a lot of reasons. I think one of the startling findings is that the women that had access to the Internet felt empowered and a greater sense of freedom. Yet, of the women who did not have access to the Internet, a startling one in five in Egypt and one in five in India said the internet was not appropriate for me and my family would disapprove of me having access to the internet. So you have these two um, challenges. You can have a greater sense of freedom and empowerment, yet it's not appropriate for you to have that information. So we have to tackle a number of um, opportunities, I guess, to close this gap and to ensure it stops the widening. One is just making people aware. About 25% of the women who don't use the internet said, I don't know why I need it. I don't know that there's any value. It means nothing to me. About 40% who don't use the internet said, I don't have a skill set. So that's something we can easily tackle as a global community is to help bring access, bring awareness, and bring the skill set. The third challenge that the women faced is about 25% fall into this category of it's not appropriate or my family would disapprove, or my culture would disapprove. And that, of course, is a much tougher challenge and one that I'll let Sec Secretary Albright solve that problem. Um, but I, I think that that one is where we are seeing some growth in some countries of this disapproval because people often see the double-edged sword that is technology. So yes, it's a great way to spread information and to spread ideas and to bring people together. 
that's also very threatening, as we're seeing in many countries as they face elections, the internet is clamped down upon, slowed down, or even closed down. So you have to really address that at the policy level and through dramatic raising of the awareness of people of what the opportunities are and what the benefits of bringing access to all their citizens would be for their country. And I think number one, if nothing else appeals to people, it's the economic growth that can happen. There's you know, just a lot of great information about the power of the internet in terms of raising economic um, prosperity for all the citizens. Um, Dr. Padilla, what's been the most effective communication tool for you in your community? What has the been the most successful sort of initiative that you have undertaken, if you say? Well, we have, uh, we use many uh, uh, kinds of technology. For example, for this uh, campaign that we made uh, one year ago, and a half a year ago, to, uh, to make the, the uh, to make that the government, well, not the government, the, the commission, the federal commission approve uh, uh, many things about the, the funds that we are, uh, that we have for the political parties, for the, the advance of women in political parties. We use mainly the, the mail. That means by emails, we made many, many things that uh, because the, the Facebook and the Twitter are mainly for young people. And the women that participate in, politi in political in political parties as candidates and all the, the things about that uh, use mainly the email. Then we <coughs> use uh, a kind of uh, informal network. That means I send my email with information, with uh, all the, the, the yeah, some kind of information uh, to my colleague in another party or a civil society or university, and my colleague sent to another colleagues, and that was, a, a, that a, I call an, informa an informal network. In Mexico, the women of my, my age, my generation, we are not, uh, uh, close to the to the technology for example I the first time that I uh, uh, that I use a, a, a personal computer I had 30 years that means I was a, a not an old woman but uh, I have my age that now the little girls the little boys uh, have a, an, uh, I don't know an iPad or a a mobile phone, etc., and my first mobile phone was in the in the 80s, and I was uh, 35, 40 years old. That means that the people like me in my country we have not the proximity to 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 use the the technology to have information. We use it now because we have the necessity we must uh, do it but we are not in, in in that area with the political woman it's the same that means that political that that one generation use the email sometimes a tablet or an, an iPad but the young woman that are in the political area that use also Facebook Twitter and and then when we use this kind of technology, we have to, to, to focus in what kind or what generation of women will we uh, send information, touch with, the, with this media, with this technology, because it's very different. Sometimes we have wi uh, women that we say, uh, I send you an email, and they say, yes, and send you um, a message by your mobile phone. They say no, because I don't know how to use it. And they say I have my, my mobile phone just to receive and make call phones, and that's it. <laughs> because it's the, the, the form that they have, uh, uh, the, the use of this, this technology. And uh, myself also, 
I have a, a, a mobile phone that uh, have internet and WhatsApp and all those kind of things, but I use so very few things. And I, I said, no, I, I can use it. Please, my, my daughter, I said, please make the configuration, use the tools and all those things because I, I don't know how to do it because I, I arrived at the technology very late. I, I, I was a, a, a woman, a mother, when I, I, I arrived to this. And in Mexico, it's the same thing for the political women. And in the rural areas, it's, it's worse because they have no access, I said, to electricity, uh, not a, a mobile phone. And it's very, uh, it's true, let's say, Shirley, that we, uh, the, the women use it less, the, the phone or the PC or the internet or whatever other technology than the men. Yeah, but it's, it's the great gap. It's, um, uh, well, Stephanie, I think, you know, one of the things we're all interested in is just how do you get the two-way conversation going? Um, you know, with all the tweeting and Facebooking and so on, I mean, how do you, how, you, how can you usefully, you know, in, in, in government, uh, corral, curate, learn from all this information and continue a sustained dialogue with a grassroots level so you're mm -hmm. not just sort of throwing out all this information into the ether and, and, and feeling that, it's just swirling around out there, and then people just feel frustrated by the fact they're being spoken at, mm -hmm. rather than dialoguing back. Mm -hmm. it, what's the solution to that for, for people who want to kind of grow movements? Uh, well, there's there's no one solution, um, and this country is not so different than what you were saying about the divide and how people use technology. It's definitely definitely generational, mm -hmm. um, though we're probably a little bit better with. Um, uh, older women using uh, a more of a variety of technology. Um, you know, just to give one example of that dialogue, um, Facebook. Women <coughs> are more likely to use Facebook than men, and uh, not young women. It's pretty much equal for uh, young people. Uh, but for older women, they're more likely to use Facebook than men. And the way that we use Facebook is exactly that, to have a more personal conversation um, and to empower them to go have conversations with their friends. Um, so Obama had about 33 million uh, friends of Obama. Uh, in total, if you looked at uh, the First Lady's Facebook page, the Vice President's, we probably had 45 to 50 million uh, of people that we could reach on Facebook. And this is not paid advertising on Facebook. That's a whole different animal. This is really just Facebook conversations like you would have. Um, and we did a couple of things to, uh, you know, obviously we would have conversations with them because they were friends with um, uh, the president's Facebook page. Um, and w one interesting statistic uh, before I get to some of the techniques, uh, of the friends of Obama on Facebook, they are then friends with 90% of all Americans on Facebook. So it was an enormous tool for us to have that personal conversation but also bypass the media, which was great. Um, <laughs> uh, so it was an unfiltered conversation. Um, and so we did a number of things. Um, we created tools to empower them to go out and do things with their Facebook friends. Uh, we had a Facebook share tool. So, um, it, you know, let's say I went to your Facebook page or um, <coughs> I'm the Obama camp campaign, you're a friend of Obama. I could tell uh, who on your Facebook page uh, hadn't registered to vote, who they had voted for in the last election based on the voter file, uh, where they were going uh, on the internet. And I could tell you, you know, oh, by the way, you have the following friends who didn't vote, who have, aren't registered to vote, could you share with them this? And we had a gotta vote tool of how they could easily register. And by empowering you to then go share this information with those targeted friends, uh, it was a much more trusted conversation with those friends than if they had heard from us, um, and they were more likely to take action. Um, similarly, we um, uh, could give you, uh, of your Facebook <coughs> friends, um, you know, uh, who were our persuadable targets, um, you know, could you share with them this information on the president's health care plan, or could you 
um, make sure that they understand that there's a rally at this particular uh, place near their home. Um, and have empower these people to go out and be, you know, basically Facebook organizers. Um, and uh, conversations through social media, um, at least in this country, are largely positive conversations if you want somebody to share something because they want to be, there's a certain pride in what they're sharing. It's almost like, you know, we all buy Us Weekly, but we don't want anybody seeing us reading Us Weekly. Yeah. Um, so they only want to share things that they want to stand behind and are proud of. And that's largely a positive conversation. So understanding that about social media um, was, uh, you know, the first step in understanding how to continue the conversation. But then we just made it very easy for people to continue those conversations. Uh, and again, as, as you're leading people down this road of registering to vote, coming to a rally, uh, you know, hopefully showing up to vote, you're figuring out how, how to bypass that Facebook person, the original Facebook friend, and have the conversation with those people along the way too. So you're constantly drawing people back in and pushing information back out. Um, Madeline, you know, we've talked a great deal about the good side of technology, but of course there's also a kind of uh, just every, everything good you can say about technology, there's also this dark side as well. I mean, uh, just as you can bring people into the streets for a good cause, you can also uh, a repressive regime, like an Assad regime, can also know exactly where people are convening and be there and repress that, 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 that group or use technology to disseminate false information, tweet out false information, mislead people and so on. I mean, what are your views about how one can, uh, in the question of democracy building as particularly, I mean, how do you function in these kind of societies with, with, with social media and so on? Because it is such a scary tool in many ways. I mean, it, is, it, can, it can create havoc. Well, just in, in listening to the others, uh, I was thinking that in terms of China, uh, where in fact uh, Google, uh, et cetera, has all of a sudden been outlawed, um, and also just generally expressing an opinion can get you in, into trouble. Then also um, the way of tracking people. I, I just think, uh, and, and having honest conversations, the, the way that you have been talking about, I think that it is very hard to explain to people that technology is their friend if they don't understand how to use it, and it also has the potential of tracking people. And so whether one tries to figure out how to teach about the positive aspects of communication and at the same time warn them about various things, I don't have an answer. I just found fascinating this discussion because I think one of the things that was the thought in setting up this panel is to have Stephanie tell us what worked in the United States and would something like that work in X country? And I think there's a real question about it because it requires a sense of trust and openness and knowing that your 33 million friends are actually very close to you uh, or uh, <laughs> trusting them at all, frankly, or whether you had not plugged into some kind of a uh, secret system that you, where you were giving away information that you shouldn't give away. And so I do think we have an awful lot to learn in this. We also have the other problem that we began talking about, which is there is this sense of freedom all of a sudden that you can send your message to the government and somebody will do something. In your opening remarks, you know, we are operating 21st century, the government's responding 19th century, if at all. And so in many ways, it contributes to a sense of frustration and chaos. And the question is, we are at the beginning of all of this. Um, and in terms of previous work that I had done about the role of the media in political change, for the most part, media and information in its initial part is incredibly disruptive. I mean, what happened is the Soviets invaded Czechoslovakia partially because of what the media was doing and Solidarity was closed down in 91 because Lech Wałęsa was sending around cassettes from one factory to another. So the, the initial aspect of it is pretty disruptive and the question is how it becomes a useful instrument. And, and I think we're really at the beginning and if you put that together with the problems of the issues of how women get involved in the first place, I think we have several kind of steps that we, we need to work our way through. Absolutely. Well, well Ping Fu herself has been the subject of tremendous flaming, uh, uh, you know, organized uh, comments. I mean, her book uh, very bravely spoke out about uh, the, uh, the atrocities of the one-child system in China. 
And thanks to that, uh, on Amazon, she received thousands and thousands of clearly organized, vicious comments uh, that had been organized by Chinese hackers who had been really obvi obviously told to go after her uh, in a way that was pretty disruptive and pretty scary. I mean, having gone through that pain, I mean, what are your views about what we're discussing? Well, I love technology, so um, I, I, I never have thought that starting a browser uh, internet and democratize that technology would make me a victim of it. Um, but, you know, it's always good against evil. Uh, two does not do bad things. People do bad things. People used to. So technology could help us to extend the greatness around the world, but it can also exaggerate bad stuff. Like, I'm in 3D printing. You all have probably read about printing 3D guns, right? This guy. Um, put a gun on internet, and in one day, a so hundred thousand people downloaded the guns. A gun doesn't shoot itself; people shoot. So, so this brought to the subject of what are the common agreed behavior in digital world. You know, believe or not, whether technology or not, technology has arrived. We live twenty four seven now today. Our our physical self is sleeping, our digital self is out there working. Your, <laughs> your friend is talking to you when you are in deep sleep. And so, <laughs> so even, like in even in this country, in America, and this is a civilized country, right? We have a civilized physical society, but we have a chaos in digital society that we have no idea how to uh, regulate that or how to agree on common behavior. Where is the line between freedom of speech versus harassment and personal attack? In fact, this non-civility behind the unanimous, you know, behind the fake ID or the um, untruth digital self is enable people to attack people in a way that that's unprecedented. We would never allow that in the physical world, but we allow that in the digital world, and it's much more, much more vicious to women. And, and, and by doing so, it prevents women to go into public life, for example. You, you say, okay, we want to encourage more women to, to participate in politics, but this digital unruly behavior is preventing a lot of people to put themselves up and front and center. Not only you have to be courageous, but you also have no way to protect your family and children. Like my family and my daughter are attacked, and I have no way to, to protect them, right? So this, this is a technology challenge I want to take on because, you know, we are, as a technologist, you are there to solve problems. So whenever there's a problem, there is opportunity. I always believe that the biggest problem is where the biggest innovation that comes. You know, the, the, the big success and big failure go hand in hand, but it is the big failure that wakes us up and help us to create solution to solve those problems. Interesting. Well, that, I mean, how much time does Intel spend, uh, Sherry, thinking about this very problem? I mean, you know, you're a massive technology company. Do you spend time thinking about how it can be, you know, subverted to, to do bad stuff to society as well as good? Yeah, absolutely, and I think the root of our belief system is that we have to educate people on how to use it and what the risks are and how to innovate around the controls that some um, people are using to control information. I, I agree with you that you know in a, we're in a period of chaos and change, and out of that will come innovative solutions that are going to move us forward. But I think that the on-the-ground examples that I think are the most compelling are exactly what you're saying. When women join together and teach each other, I'm sure all of us who are on Facebook, you learn a lot from your friends about how to shut off certain controls and everyone's alerting each other. You know, they change the privacy policy, go read it again, you may not like your controls right now. I think that's exactly the behavior set that will move the whole industry forward and move the community forward as women rely on each other. If you think about the organization like World Pulse, which is a grassroots organization to give women a voice through technology so they can create a community that will support them. And they spend that time, whether it's physically or digitally, helping each other, teaching each other. And the skills gap is, is the right place to attack. We can use the skills gap 
to train people appropriately at the grassroots level. We are working with governments all over the world, but in India, just one example, the government passed a new policy that one person in each household shall be digitally literate, which you know is a great policy, but then how do you go about making that happen? And what we're doing is working on a program called Easy Steps, which is exactly what it says. Take the easy step. What is the thing that you need technology for? You don't need to learn all about everything right now, but what will help your life be better? Do you need access to education for your children? Do you need access to the marketplace to sell your crop? Do you need to grow your business? Do you need to market your business? Whatever specifically you need, that's what the program brings to you, to bring you into technology and start to teach you what the risks are and what the benefits are in a very safe environment with your peers. So I think that's going to be needed is the approach at the real grassroots level to bring people together. Stephanie, I think we're going to have to wind up actually now, but I just wanted just to have one last question, if I may, to Stephanie, which is just, you know, you in the middle of a political campaign, you are in the middle of huge smear attacks at all time. I mean, you're running a war room where the digital army is in your face, you know, with yes. counter information, <laughs> right? How did you, ha what was your uh, functionality on, 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 on sort of rebutting and, and, and dealing with that? Well, we, um, you can't respond to everything on the internet. Um, and, you know, we monitored it pretty closely to figure out what the, the trends were, really, um, to figure out how big a conversation was getting. Uh, we created this online group of people called the Truth Team uh, that was very successful and again, empowering them with information to go beat back these attacks. Because when it's coming from the campaign, you discount it a little bit. Yeah, of course they're gonna say that. They're trying to win the election. But if it's coming from somebody else uh, who took it upon themselves to go research a question, you're, it's more believable to the end user. Um, so this truth team grew to hundreds of thousands of people online who were being armed with information and then go and going and, and spreading it. It was enormously effective in uh, eventually making itself a way around to the press, <laughs> which is still the primary culprit for the attacks if you want to launch the old anti, you know, prehistoric press. <laughs> the <finally>. prehistoric press. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Very. Um, um. So uh, you know, you can't beat back everything online. You have to pick your fights, and you should just pick the ones where the conversation is moving and spreading. Um, just going back even eight years in this country, uh, remember Swift Boats with John Kerry? Um, that started on the internet, and we didn't pay attention to it. Um, we thought it would stay on the internet and not migrate its way into mainstream press. Uh, it festered for a very long time and eventually made its way into the mainstream press. Um, and that was a lesson to every political campaign after that, that you have to monitor this and watch where that conversation is going. Thank you very much. Well, listen, we could go on a long time, but we have to stop. Um, this has been the most amazingly brilliant panel. Uh, I want to thank them very much. And I'd actually like to now open up to the audience. We have a few minutes, I think, for some questions. And would anybody like to ask one over here? Hi, thank you so much. I'm not sure if this is on. Emmy Kalawale with the Washington Post. Um, I was curious if you could comment, um, particularly uh, Ping Fu, if you wouldn't mind, um, and also Stephanie, um, where does manipulation begin and empowerment stop when you are using technology to sort of get more women involved in democracy? Because there comes a point sort of where powerful entities can have a lot of money and then sort of be spread their me message across. So I'm wondering when does that line get crossed and how do you keep that line from being crossed? In my case, the, it's pretty new. Um, it's on my books out in January, and within three months, I got like 13,000 comments on internet. Um, it all started with one mob in China who has 11 million followers, and he organized a group of radical people who just he supplied information in, in this same as a truth group way. And then, and those thousands of people just keep going on the internet and posting. And then, some internet do moderate them, like Amazon doesn't. So they literally use Amazon as, as a bulletin board. And then they'll vote on any positive comment, and they vote up their own comments. Like they they would have put some ridiculous comments, and thousands of people would come and voted up. They would have voted up like four times more than Harry Potter ever got. 
uh, in the lifetime, I was like, oh, wow, this is interesting. Um, I haven't started this true schools yet. That's a very interesting one. What I have done was just try, A, try to ignore them and not to respond, because the minute you respond, you put the fuel, uh, you, you put the oil into the fire. Um, the second is to respond, only pick the conversation I want and not to respond with the conversation you don't want. Uh, leveraging major media was great. Tina had helped me by interviewing me, let my voice to be heard, and that was very helpful. Um, but I just heard your recommendation. I think that would be a really good, good way to do it also. And one of the things I did do is to always keep calm and always keep civil and just never play their game. That's very good. <laughs> and it's hard to do. Um, I mean, the question about what, where's the line between I information and organizing versus <coughs> manipulation using the internet? Yeah, so it's the information that you have to do and the things that you have to do in order to make sure that you are being organized and that you're not being manipulated. Well, I mean, you know how the, the American system works. The information that a campaign, or the, this is the way it's supposed to work, or it worked in my experience. The information that you put out on a campaign through the internet is no different than the information you'd be handing out at a door, uh, or you'd be giving a speech on, or if I were doing a media interview. It's the same information, because there are so many checks and balances in our system that you'd be called on it um, if you're crossing that line with manipulation through false information. Now, that's not to be, I mean, there is lots of false information out there that is spread through the internet in political debates. Uh, but not uh, from, in my experience, from campaigns. Um, you know, a good example of that, uh, the president's religion in 2008. That was something that was spread uh, through the internet um, and rarely ever touched in mainstream press, but it was this internet phenomenon and it was wholly made up out of nowhere. Complete, complete manipulation of the facts. Um, and was done for a particular purpose. We all know the purpose of it. Um, but, you know, that's somebody out there beginning a manipulation campaign. We'd love to know who it is, but, y you know, that's the way the internet works. You never will know uh, where it actually starts. Um, so manipulation is possible. It's not really done by the political parties, um, at least that you can see. Um, but. You know, that's the, the beauty of the internet and the danger of the internet. Everybody is made equal. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, coming and having this fantastic panel. Uh, the growth of democracy and the spread of civil rights is almost never a peaceful process, both uh, in the American Revolution, the French Revolution, you know, through the Arab Spring and the conflict in Syria. And, and can you uh, comment on the role of technology and the empowerment of women with technology? Um, in potentially changing the paradigm under which uh, you know oppressive state control is effective, and and the context under which foreign intervention should and and potentially can be used. Um. <laughs> Who is that question addressed to? <laughs> Madeline, I think that's yours. <laughs> well, I, I think that um, we always have examples. I mean, if, as you go back through history, obviously change really often uh, is dynamic and they're called revolutions for a reason. Um, I think there also often is some kind of an outside source to it. Um, and I think we, there's rarely is there kind of an internal pristine revolution that doesn't have some influence from abroad in some form or another. I think that what we are seeing now as a result of technology and globalization is a lo an awful lot of information that is out there in terms of what the um, motivation is for change, internal change, and then if there's any motivation externally to get regime change or um, whatever one wants to call it. So it's that combination of outside information and inside information. Then you do have an awful lot of um, disaggregated information. I think that you've been talking about as some form of a campaign where there are messages. There's an awful lot that happened in the Arab awakening that has nothing to do with an organized message. Um, there were some that were organized, but mostly it was various people with their own ideas. And so then that gets mixed into it, 
and it's very hard to tell when that goes viral. I mean, partially, I think people are looking at the, the there was one blogger that in Egypt really did have a very large influence in terms of kind of the connections that he made. But on the whole, what we've seen is just this rise of an awful lot of disaggregated information. The role of women in it, I think, is very hard to pin down. You were talking about the, the one woman in Egypt. I think that there were women and are women that have found the possibility of anonymity in this so that they can act without being sexually abused um, within that situation, that then when they get out and are, actual and are out there in the streets, may get a different reaction to them. Yeah, but you know, Dahlia Ziada did write but under a man's name. She yeah, well, and I th so that's part of They're dealing, I have found this a very interesting panel, but partially we've combined an awful lot of different subjects that may or may not go together, frankly. I think that there is the whole issue of how women get empowered in any society, and especially developing ones, and especially ones that may have um, an, an a different religious or ethnic context to them. So we have that issue. Then we have the technology issue. And then we have just general spread of revolution uh, because people want change. Um, and they get that change for some internal reasons and also external. But I, I think this is a new phenomenon in terms of the rapidity of the information spread, not uh, in terms of whether outside forces have ever had influence on revolutions, because they always have in some form or another. Of one, one of the phenomenon in, in this um, using technology is that the extreme voice gets heard more than the normal voice. In the society, we actually want the more of the normal behavior rather than the extreme. And then the extreme voice also tend to divide rather than um, unite. So I wonder, like, our country also gets more and more divided, you know, how much that has to do with the voice being heard on the internet. I certainly think there are a lot more is in the behavior, commonly agreed behavior than the technology itself. Technology can help us spread the good or the bad. And but right now, because we understand so little of it, so a lot of bad is arising. And, and, and that's that's what we need to deal with. Last question. We have one time for one more. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, this has been a great <laughs> session. I've learned a lot. I'd like to put forth an idea about a, a nexus between d uh, women and technology and national security. It seems as if most of us here would agree that women are key to so many of the problems that we have. The, the, we have a, a problem with, um, with insurgents, with, um, with keeping our, our country safe, and by focusing on women and um, women um, being more powerful via technology, that could serve as a powerful force to, let me rephrase this. What if we, we took our Department of Defense budget and our State Department, USAID budget, and we inverse them? What if, I mean, a high speed, a harm, a high speed anti-radiation missile um, costs about 500, million dollars, $500,000 of a pop, and we throw them around like gumballs. What if we use the kind of resources that we um, put into the Defense Department to build ships and missiles and planes and wreak death and destruction everywhere and con started concentrating it more in diplomatic um, circles um, toward work that the NDI does, um, toward a Re toward providing w um, women with the education and resources, people on the ground to um, uh, um, give to um, educate them and empower them, make them leaders in their um, their their whatever area in the world. Would Would you please talk about? I'm sorry, it's a long question. Would you please talk about that that nexus between women and national security and technology? Th thank you very much. Well, let me. Um, it would be nice. <laughs> but uh, I think that part of the issue, if you look at the discrepancy between the Defense Department budget, which is probably, uh, who knows exactly the amount, but around $500, $600 billion, and the State Department budget is more like $45 billion, um, it goes to show you that um, our uh, balance is not exactly right. I think that 
part of the problem is that um, it is very hard to persuade people that a woman can defend her country than a better than a battleship. That, I mean, it comes down to something like that. And so we have to change an awful lot of the way we think about the longer term aspect of um, the role that women can play in, in terms of political and economic empowerment. Uh, it helps when you have a woman Secretary of State. Um, as a matter of fact, my granddaughter three years ago said, what's the big deal about Grandma Maddie being Secretary of State? Only girls are Secretary of State. So, <laughs> um, but but I, I do think that in fact what has to happen is a better understanding that women's issues are not just about women, that they are mm -hmm. human issues, that they are issues that make for better societies, that they are um, issues that in fact do make us safer, but we are a very long way from that. And I think having these kinds of discussions and trying to sort out what differences they can make uh, will push the process forward. But you're gonna have a very hard time um, in terms of the budgets. It's something that many of us have been involved in in, in many different ways. It's a tough issue. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. I think uh, there's so much rich uh, food for thought here. So thank you so much, my wonderful panelists, and uh, thank you very much for joining us.